Welcome to the Swap Like University Women's Public Lecture. Women's Day is a moment in time that is commemorated and celebrated across South Africa. We stand still and commemorate how women stood in solidarity in 1956, changing the course of history as they petitioned against a system that required people of color to carry the Dompas. Since the demonstration, of this profound message, women have taken a stance on various platforms to affirm their roles as equal players. Through the Soplike University's Women's Month public lecture, we interact, critically engage, and observe as the presence of women continues to bring transformation on various platforms. As we embrace this global effort of South Africa to achieve gender equality by 2030, so like University have adopted the theme, generation equality, reali realizing a woman's right for an equal future. With that being said, I will now call on our Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Professor Jean Baxson, to do our official welcome. Professor Baxson, served in various leadership positions at a number of higher education institutions in the country. She is the author of numerous research reports, peer-reviewed and accredited papers, and book chapters on aspects of education in South Africa. Prof. Baxson is an active member of the education community in South Africa and internationally. She sits on a number of editorial boards, advisory committees, and review panels. This, only, this is only but a synopsis of this phenomenal woman who, on the academic front, is testament to realizing women's rights for an equal future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Baxson as she will do the official opening to this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Warren, and a warm good afternoon uh, to all of you, um, members of the SPU community, and to our special guest who is joining us today, Ms. Hendricks. A warm word of welcome to you, ma'am, and we look forward to uh, sharing bread with you uh, on this momentous and important occasion. Um, Women's Month uh, is celebrated, as Caroline said, around the world, uh, particularly uh, maybe not the month, but the rights of women is shared and uh, commemorated around the world. And we know of strong women who have uh, eloquently uh, as well as uh, courageously inhabited spaces that have brought us here today, that have allowed people like myself and women on this platform to be able to take their rightful place in uh, different spheres of life, be it political, be it professional, uh, even in the home. And so the position of women uh, in society is something that continually plagues us and that continually is something that we have to put at the forefront of our struggle and our endeavor. Um, I'm not sure whether we want to be equal to men and maybe that is a, a discussion that we can have. I think for me, the important aspect is equitable opportunities for anybody, irrespective of your gender, irrespective of how you identify yourself, and irrespective of race, class, uh, age, or any of those isms that are placed on us. Uh, often we do not identify with those isms, but they are placed upon us. And so for me, uh, the conversation today is about equitable opportunities 
that are not mediated, mediated through the way we look and the way we present uh, in, in particular spaces. I, I look forward to our discussion because I think the, the issues that we're going to raise today continue to be uh, aspects that we've got to animate in our environment and not let our guards down. Uh, those of you who are on this platform will know how difficult it is to identify as female uh, and occupy uh, positions that are dominated by male. Uh, and in South Africa, it is uh, reinscribed through gender, not only gender, but reinscribed also through race and through class. And so the the discursive space that we inhabit is very, very complex. And so I would not want us to only um, discuss gender, but also put into the mix the way in which race, class, gender uh, uh, come together to create experiences that do not lead to equitable opportunities. And so I want to challenge us to complexify the space in ways that um, uh, create discussions that lead to uh, real outcomes, uh, that lead to more equitable opportunities, not only in our, in our university, but in the communities where we have uh, some influence. And so welcome to the small university in the Northern Cape, what I call a quiet revolution in the Northern Cape. So welcome, Ms. Hendricks, and welcome to the SPU community. Thank you. Thank you for your warm welcome and your words of wisdom as always, and also thought provoking comments that you made. Um, thank you for setting the tone. And I trust that all our people on this platform uh, do feel welcome. So thank you, Prof. The one thing that I really appreciate what you said now was that equity should not have faces. We must not, when we talk about uh, opportunities, it must not be linked to any gender or race in particular, but we must find a place or platform where we can share and also um, create opportunity for all. So thank you, Prof. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to call on our guest speaker for the Soplaiki University Women's Month Public Lecture, Ms. Sumaya Hendricks. Ms. Hendricks is the Dialogue and Advocacy Acting Manager at the Nelson Mandela Foundation, where she heads up the work on early childhood development and land reform. Sumaya was awarded the Chancellor Unis Scholarship to pursue a MSc in Social Business and Microfinance at Glasgow Caledonian University in Scotland, which she passed with distinction. She holds an Economics Honours degree from the University of Witwatersrand and a Bachelor of Commerce degree in Politics, Philosophy and Economics from the University of Cape Town. She is currently completing a Doctor of Philosophy in Education um, at the University of Advertisrant. Ms. Hendricks was the coordinator of the ASRI Future Leaders Program and served on the 2009-2010 SRC at the University of Cape Town in the position of Chair of Academics. For her performance on the SRC, she received the Executive Director of the Department of Student Affairs Student Leader Award. As we hear a synopsis of her engagement on various platforms, it is evident Ms. Hendricks is the generation of young professional woman who is making her mark in realizing women's rights for an equal future. Ladies and gentlemen, let us receive Ms. Sumaya Hendricks. Deputy Vice Chancellor Professor Jean Paxson, Program Director Ms. Caroline Horn, 
um, acting head of the School of Humanities, Prof. Karen here. Thank you so much for sharing this platform with me. Uh, thank you so much to all of you and to the organizers for this really kind invitation. Um, I heard the Deputy Vice Chancellor speak about the university as a place of a quiet revolution. And uh, it reminds me of something Madiba said, which is that it is it would be quite odd to to be young and not radical um, and to be old and not conservative. So I uh, hope to um, make uh, full use of that um, um, you know, quote by by really um, exploiting that as a young person, and and I hope that we can complexify and really delve into some of this um, the issues that we need to today. But I really hope that this is also an inspirational space, a place that is uplifting, and that we can come together and really grow ourselves. So if this is a place of a quiet revolution, I hope. Uh, firstly, I'm very part to be uh, happy to. Uh, be part of that quiet revolution, and uh, hopefully we can turn up the sound um, and uh, on that revolution. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that I am very grateful and I was really humbled to receive the invitation. I think it really speaks to the vision of the, uh, the university to have a young person uh, deliver this important uh, lecture. So thank you so much, and um, I think um, this kind of visionary leadership is really what we need. So as I reflected on what I wanted to speak to today, I really wanted to ensure that I do not center men uh, in this discussion. Because I think quite easily a discussion um, and a dialogue or any engagement on Women's Day can easily inadvertently, inadvertently become about men, even if that's not the intention. And quite frankly, I think, you know, men occupy too much of our mental and physical energy. So I really want today to be about us. Yes, there are serious issues of patriarchy and misogyny that we need to deal with, but I wanted, my intention is really for this to be uplifting, for you to leave here feeling inspired in some way, and for you to feel um, that you, you really want to, you feel motivated to go and um, you know, develop yourself further at women. So this is really about us and I want that engagement to be here. So I plan on hopefully planting a seed or watering a seed that you've already planted for yourself for you to think about the kind of uh, future you want and the kind of person that you want to be. And with this in mind, I'm going to center today's remarks around four pieces of advice. And intertwined in these different pieces of advice, I'm going to um, put forward some inspirational stories of a woman. And I wanted to use storytelling because there's really an incredible collective of a woman that we can draw inspiration from. And the thing about inspiration is that we do not need to um, share the opinions of people in its entirety to take inspiration from them. They don't need to look like us, be from the same place that we are. But we can, um, you know, even if we disagree with elements of what they have to offer and, and, you know, and what are some of the thinking or otherwise, is that we can separate the meat from the bones, which is really, you know, a way of saying that we take what we find beneficial, so the meat, and we take that and we use that and we build from that and we discard what we don't find valuable, which is the bones. So I hope today that there's significant meat in this discussion and that you really take away something from these inspirational stories. Because there are really some incredible women doing extraordinary things and doing wonderfully ordinary things that we can take inspiration from. Before I, I start with these various pieces of advice, I wanted to make a disclaimer that um, I don't want to give any false impression that I have life figured out. I think that um, one is continuously trying to figure life out as you enter new and different stages in your life. So with that disclaimer out of the way, my first piece of advice and the first thing I want to speak to is grit. And a really good book that I would recommend on this is a book by Angela Duckworth entitled Grit. Now there are people um, who have passion, so they know what they're interested in, but they lack perseverance. 
Then there are people who uh, have perseverance. They are ready to work hard and they are hard workers and they're ready to put in the work, but they don't know what they're passionate about. And um, so they don't know necessarily what interests them. Now, grit is the combination of both passion and perseverance. Now, for those wanting to be gritty and develop this gritness, um, it's really hard to do it by yourself, um, you know, all the time. So here my advice is, you know, make sure that you keep um, gritty people in your, your circle of friends. Now, you know, sometimes when we're forming circle of friends, I know many of you, um, you know, I'm speaking to a younger audience. Uh, we keep friends because, you know, there are ones that are there for us and people we can connect with. But when forming bonds of friendship, also think about having gritty friends around you. Now, you know, if you're a science student, it doesn't mean, um, you know, you can have friends that have interest in other, other fields and might not share the same interest as you, but their grittiness can rub off on you. Um, just by you observing their behavior. Now, for those that have um, perseverance, but they might not know what their passions are, I definitely feel like when I was younger, this is the category that I felt into. And it can be very frustrating because you're ready, you want to give off yourself, but you don't really know what interests you. And here I would recommend really making the most of university life. You know, as women, take up leadership spaces, start organizations, start societies, you know, really make them um, the use of uh, the institution that you are at and make it into the institution that you want it to be. So it can provide, you know, doing this can provide an opportunity to find your passion uh, and it can be a byproduct in involving yourself in these things. And even if you don't find your passion exactly, you can find the things that interests you, you know, activities, or um, it can be a good launching pad for you to develop your skills. Now, for those that uh, have passions and they know what interests them, but they don't necessarily have perseverance or feel that they struggle with perseverance. Now, discipline, um, I think, is something that is incredibly important when you're young and especially as you get older and the earlier you invest in, in yourself and really trying to um, um, develop um, those qualities around perseverance and discipline, the, the better it's going to bode for your life. And so, you know, because we all anecdotally have that friend, you know, the really talented one who is full of potential, but, you know, they unfortunately lack discipline and perseverance in their life. And it can be something that's really detrimental. So here, really push yourself to follow things on the things that you've committed to. And that's a really good way of developing grit. So do the things that you committed to do, even if you don't feel like, um, you know, it might not necessarily be Oscar worthy or Nobel Prize worthy, the outcome, but there will be success in you completing it, completing it despite the fact that you didn't feel like you were in the mood to do it or there were better and more interesting things to do or watch. The second piece of advice I would give here for developing perseverance would be around, think about the things that you can anchor in your day or the routines that you can have that can help you develop discipline that can then filter through in other areas of your life. Personally, for me, it's prayer. Um, and, you know, having these kind of anchors in my day um, it helps to filter, you know, develop a discipline in me that can that filters it out into other things. So even if I'm not in the mood or if I have important meetings, it's, you know, this is a commitment that I've made and really trying to stick to it. So some suggestions is, so for example, you can commit to reading for 20 minutes before you go to sleep every night and irrespective of how you feel, you follow through on this commitment. Or you can commit to exercising every morning for 15 minutes um, and, you know, keep to it despite the weather or however you feel. And this can really be a launching pad to develop the life that you want. Now, when I think about grittiness, um, someone, a South African woman comes to mind by the name of Sachi van der Kaap. Sachi van der Kaap went from being a slave to a landowner and you know, that's what young people, I think, would call a real hustle, um, which is incredibly gr gr gritty. So just a bit more about her. 
she was born in 1775. She was born into slavery um, and she was emancipated or emitted uh, or manumitted um, around the age of four years old. And both her parents were also slaved, but also later emancipated. Now, her father went on to purchase two properties in Bukap in Cape Town. So Bukap, um, for those of you that don't know, is in the inner city in Cape Town. And so he purchased these two properties and one of the, on one of these properties, um, there was a mosque that was built. It's called the Owl Masjid and it is the first and oldest mosque in South Africa and it's, it's still in operation today. And it was formed, so it was during the time of British occupation and it was the main religious institution for many years in the Cape. Now at the age of 34 years old, Sachi van der Kaap went on to purchase these two properties from her family. So she actually had bought it from her mother um, who had come in possession of it after her father had passed away. Sachi van der Kaap had incredible foresight. She wanted to make sure that the land that, you know, this mosque was built on continued to benefit future generations to come. So she did a really incredible thing, which is she in her will before she died, she had said that um, the mosque on which this land that she owns is built is never to be sold or mortgaged. And, you know, by doing that, she really preserved this institutions for generations to come. So here is a woman who went from slave owner to land owner and not just a land owner, the land that she owned went on to be um, you know, housing an institution that was of benefit to her community um, through her endowment. So grit, that was the one piece of advice. The second piece of advice is around getting used to rejection and not letting the fear of rejection hold you back from pursuing opportunities. I call this the, you miss all the shots you don't take. So don't be afraid, especially as a woman, don't be afraid to ask for that promotion, to ask for a salary increase, to apply for that job, um, even if you don't meet all the, the, um, the requirements. You know, unfortunately, we have a situation where, you know, we have a job application and, you know, often, um, and there's been research around this that speaks to the fact that men are more likely to apply for a job even when they don't meet all the criteria compared to a woman. And these are kind of things that we must break through. We must um, realize that we must take our shots, that we must ask for things. Um, and the fear of getting a no or a rejection, um, this is something that mustn't hold us back. Because I think if COVID has taught us anything, um, you know, during this extremely traumatic uh, period for many families is that we don't know how much time we have. And so we really have to make the most of opportunity by developing ourselves, pursuing opportunities and not being afraid of a no. Because a no, even sometimes if you have a no, um, you know, it can open up doors for other opportunities. And as you get older, you'll see this happening where maybe, um, you know, someone turned you down for something, but they'll say, listen, we don't have this opportunity, but have you thought about this? Have you spoken to X, Y, Z? Um, and it can really open up other opportunities for you. And on that note, I want to share a story of another South African woman with you. So this South African woman, um, was from the Eastern Cape, um, from Port Elizabeth. Um, and she and her family were forcibly removed from South End, um, which is in Port Elizabeth. She was the only daughter of four daughters to go to university, which was made possible by a bursary that she got from the then Department of Colored Affairs. So she studied social work at the University of the Western Cape. Now, after a few years of working off this bursary, um, she then re relocated to Utenek or Aitenhek. So 23 years old in a new city in Utenek, and now she's needing to find a job. So she, um, you know, she came across someone from the management committee in the area um, who said that, you know, the council hadn't previously uh, had a social worker and she could put in a proposal and motivate um, you know, why the council should consider creating this post. Now, at the time, just for background, 
um, the Group Areas Act was being implemented in Utenek, and so uh, people were facing forced evictions. So this young 23-year-old woman asked herself, what is it that I can do to make a contribution in the space that I am now? She went on to write the proposal for the council. And in short, she took her shot and it was accepted. And they accepted her proposal and they hired her. As outlined in her proposal, she would be responsible for social issues which arose in um, the area, which is you know, very typical of a social worker. But she realized there was an opportunity to do even more than this, and she saw a gap. You know, having experienced forced evictions herself, she realized that um, there was a role that she could play here. So, and at the time, she was very realistic. She saw that in the housing office, that was overseeing this really traumatic program. They were only admin related people and she couldn't imagine how more traumatic the program of forced evictions would be if it were going to be implemented um, by the staff. So she had put in her proposal um, that she wants to be, you know, attached to this housing office and um, give people who are being forcibly um, evicted the opportunity to at least choose their neighbors. Now, this it wasn't something that the, the council had uh, previously considered. Um, so she would ask people, you know, do you um, have an existing neighbor or a family friend or um, anyone that you'd like um, to be your neighbor? Because she recognized that people were coming from established communities and were being forced out of these communities. And so she could do nothing or she could at least do this, which gave people some semblance of home um, and some sense of community um, during this brutality of apartheid. Um, so, and, and, and she realized, which is really important, that by doing nothing, it would really add to the, the trauma that, that people were experiencing. Um, I'm really incredibly honored um, and grateful to, to have this woman as my mother. Um, and to see firsthand the different ways throughout her life in which she asked herself the question, what is it that I can do now to make um, a contribution and to add value in the space that I am in? Now, when speaking about the life motto of you miss all the shots you don't take, it's important to raise here um, an issue of gatekeeping, racism and patriarchy. And I'm going to do this by uh, sharing a personal story with you. So when I was applying for my PhD, I was looking for a supervisor. And so I had to proactively set up meetings um, with potential supervisors. And I had met with an old white um, male professor. Now, he told me um, very early on in that meeting that um, I should rather apply to um, another university and not the WITS education department. He told me that it would be unlikely that I would get funding. Um, and if I plan to do my PhD part time, um, that I rather not apply. Now, this was all very peculiar because the reason why I had found this professor is because through my research, I had found that he had supervised a young white male who was studying part time and who had a very similar topic to the one that I wanted to do. And I was really flabbergasted and so incredibly disheartened that someone um, firstly based in an educational institution such as university could be so discouraging towards a student. Um, and, and on top of that, um, to add injury, to be in an education department and to be so discouraging towards um, students. Thankfully, my PhD application was already in and two supervisors put up their hands and said that they would like to supervise me. So despite his discouragement, I was accepted. I received funding and have been getting funding for um, the years that I've been registered at the institution and I'm nearing the end of my PhD. And I want to speak to this experience because in pursuing the you miss all the shots you don't take mentality, you will come up against behaviors 
and attitudes um, that will discourage you, but you must push on and take your shot. The third piece of advice I'd like to speak to is about dreaming a full life for yourself. Now, I always considered myself to be someone who was ambitious and you know, hardworking, but I distinctly remember getting to the age of 27 years old and thinking, okay, now what? And when I reflected on this, I realized that subconsciously, um, I think that by that age, I, I just assumed life would take over, that I would have kids and instead of me leading my life, my life would lead me. And I really attribute this to the kind of messages that society feed women. So dream a full life and lead your life as opposed to just letting your life lead you. And in speaking about leading a full life, the story I want to share with you here is about a North African woman called Fatima al fehri Now, Fatima al fehri was born in Tunisia and um, her family relocated from Tunisia to the city of Fez in Morocco when she was young. Unfortunately, we do not know a lot about her life, but what we do know is that both her and her sister Mariam were very well educated. Now, Fatima Fehri wanted to do something of benefit to her community. And so she looked around and um, she identified a gap and she realized that a university was needed, a place of higher year learning. So she founded the al Qarawiyun University that is in Fez in Morocco. It had a courtyard, a, a, a prayer hall, uh, a library and school rooms. It offered subjects in geography and math mathematics and theology and logic. And um, the really incredible thing about this university is that it was founded more than a thousand years ago and continues to be in operation to this day, making it the oldest university in the world that can still continues to operate. Um, and so it predates its European counterparts like the University of Oxford by at least uh, 200 years. So here we have a story of an African woman who wanted to do something of benefit uh, to her community and built a university with the resources that she had. Fatima al fehri dreamed a full life for herself, far beyond the years that she even she would be alive to see. Now, also on, talk, on the point of dreaming a full life for ourselves, I think that, um, you know, I, I was happy about the, um, the remarks that the Deputy Vice Chancellor had made around, you know, equality versus equity, um, because I think that, you know, as I was saying, discussions when we, you know, speak about gender equality can easily become about men because we're talking about being in, equal in relation to something. Um, and one of my worries is that when we speak about gender equality, often what we speak to or what occupies a lot of the discourse is around equal access to employment, to equal pay and the benefits um, the, or the mechanisms that can help facilitate this. Now, this is undoubtedly an important part of gender equality, especially in a country like South Africa, where women of color um, faced and continue to face a double barricade to entering the workplace as a result of being both a woman and a person of color. The reason why this dimension of gender equality is also incredibly important is because um, in South Africa, especially attending a university, many of us carry the material and financial aspirations of our family. And so having good employment is central to this. But with that said, I do want for both for you and for me to think beyond this as we plan full lives for ourselves. I once read a tweet by a teenager that said that, um, a young teenager that said that um, they do not dream of employment. And I think what they were trying to say is that they do not occupy themselves thinking about the job they are going to have when they grow up. Now, if there is a part of me that resonated with this because 
I think what we should be thinking about is the contribution we want to make, the institutions we want to build, the kind of people that we want to be, kind of skills we want to develop, um, especially when having a qualification in a certain area doesn't limit you to one particular sector um, in this, um, you know, in this current climate and for the foreseeable future. If we are so, if we are to achieve a more equal society, our measure cannot simply be about whether a woman now occupies a job that a man previously held or traditionally held. Our focus should be on developing ourselves and our potential, not in relation to our, in, in relation to men, because I think holding men as a standard of success is a way of holding us back. Because we have the potential, I contend, to exceed um, what any man we know has achieved. However, if we're constantly using the success of men as a, as a benchmark and a barometer to gauge our own personal success, then in doing so, we can overlook the even greater successes that we can achieve. Overlook the institutions we can build and help shape and influence and overlook the contribution we can make. If the Fatima al Fahris and the Sachi van der Kaps of this world looked around and simply wanted to aspire to what the men around them were doing, they would not have achieved what they achieved. And both their communities and the world would have been poorer for this. Now, my final piece of advice, um, the, fourth, the fourth piece, is a bit more of a cautionary tale. As I mentioned, I'm doing my PhD, and what I'm looking at is the experience, the learning experiences of graduate interns on government internship programs. And I had a very disturbing quote um, by one of the uh, graduate interns that I had interviewed, and I thought to read to you what she had said. So this is a direct quote from her, from the, the person that I interviewed. In different units, it's difficult because mostly if you are an intern and especially if you are a lady, you become a target. That is one thing that I've seen in the corridors. So you become a target where they check you. OK, this is how she dresses. And then you become a target of the other males who are permanently there. So they see you as a target like, oh, I can get with this one and then I can date him and her. And this was incredibly um, difficult uh, to hear. So, and, and she went on to give an example of, you know, um, a situation where a young uh, woman, um, you know, uh, faced um, a problem and was being taken advantage of in, in the, that particular um, department. So while you are at university, um, preparing to enter the workplace, you need to be conscious that um, there will be people and men that will seek to take advantage of you. And you may come across um, or be victim to workplace harassment. Your colleagues may say things that are inappropriate to you. This quote that I read you is not from 1990, not even 2010. It's from 2020, um, which is last year. So you need to know that you have the right to speak up and to speak out. You have the right to change culture. You have the right to report things that make you feel uncomfortable. You have the right to quote unquote cause a scene because patriarchy's time is up. So as I wrap up, develop grit. Remember that you miss all the shots you don't take. Live a full life. And we can call the last piece of advice, screw the patriarchy. The stories that I've shared with you uh, was done with the hope of inspiring both you and me to really think about how we can go about developing ourselves and reaching our full potential and in doing so also developing our community and communities. Um, so thank you so much for listening. They are really such incredible women that we can draw inspiration from. Someone who I think is really overlooked in South African history is, is uh, Charlotte Matreke. Um, you know, South Africa's first black graduate and who also started numerous institutions uh, during her lifetime. And perhaps during the engagement session, engagement um, session, 
you can share stories of us, of women that inspire you to be gritty, that inspire you to take shots, and that inspire you to lead a full life. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Sumaya, for really that thought-provoking lecture um, that you just gave us and reminding us that we need to seize moments of opportunities as we continue to navigate and engage through life. Um, very, very interesting point that I that I picked up is, is this word that you use, grit, G-R-I-T. Um, is it a new construct that we are using? Um, but I, but I like the idea and just the reminder around that we need to choose really our circle um, carefully that will help us to uh, restore and sort of invigorate and, 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 and hype up our passion and also the support in, in, in perseverance. And then um, I like the stories that you shared with us, relevant stories that, that we can actually relate to. Um, not far-fetched, the serious um, stories that of people, of women in particular, that we have not heard um, that is from South Africa. So thank you for reminding us um, to even look um, at, in our own uh, communities on the continent of Africa. And the getting to sort of embrace or getting used to the rejection um, I think all of us on this platform have experienced rejection um, on all levels. Um, but if we take the shot, then we will make it, we will survive. And if we embrace even um, that those rejections and we must dream of a full life and not limit ourselves to, to our societal realities and even um, our realities in our homes. So, so thank you, thank you very much for this very thought-provoking uh, lecture that you shared or words of wisdom and advice that you shared with us. There's some questions that I think that will help us to formulate this discussion and sort of push and, and hear what is happening for our people, you know, outside. So let me start. The question is sometimes when trying to follow your passion in life, others tell you to be practical, and focus on what is important. How can I know that my passion is worthy and not actually a waste of time or really unimportant? So that's the one question, the question on passion. And maybe a second question, how can I use my passion to uplift others and make their lives better? I have a huge passion for running, but how can I use that for the good of others especially women. Um, thank you so much, Program Director, and thank you so much for these questions. And, um, you know, while I'm, I've been asked to speak here today, um, there are also, um, you know, incredibly experienced women on this panel. So it might be that they also have, um, you know, other things to add what, to what I'm going to say. I think, let me start with the latter question around um, the questioner, speaking to the fact that they have a passion around running and how can you make, um, a um, contribution with this. And one of the things I think about is, um, I don't know if people have heard of Humans of New York. Um, it's a page that has, you know, ranked up um, millions and millions of followers on Facebook and on social media platforms. And they have commissioned to do various uh, pieces of work um, by, um, you know, international institutions. And here was this, um, this individual, this young person that um, had a love for photography. So what he did was he started going around New York to take pictures of people, um, you know, th these wonderfully ordinary people that I spoke about um, and um, hear the stories. And it really resonated with people, um, you know, um, taking both the picture and hearing these stories. So he took a passion that he didn't think that he could go about creating, um, you know, a difference for. And he's now traveled the world because what people realize that you can do is that with those stories and those pictures, you can build bridges be between people. 
um, uh, because you're starting to hear stories from from countries um, you know that that you have never been to and from people you've never um, different types of people you've never spoken to before and you really get a glimpse into their world so there's really an opportunity to use anything and I mean with running um, you know thinking around um, you know making sure that young people have um, exercise but also have good outlets I think um, there's not enough um, activities for young people in our communities um, and how do you go about using whatever sport it is you know it could be running or um, you know surfing or playing soccer how can we use something like that to get young people to uh, do useful things with their energy and that's productive and they can go um, you know learning how to run um, can filter into other areas of uh, one's life as we spoke about earlier uh, because there's a discipline that can come from running um, so I think there's a lot of things that you know could be done with that um, and 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 even in the process of running thinking about how can you actually go about mentoring young people um, in this activity because uh, you go about learning young people I mean meeting young people in the process or people in general and really forming bonds um, uh, with them and, and a point I want to make here is um, when I was doing my uh, social my master's um, in social business in Scotland we went to this very small coastal town um, with the name of which I forget and um, the social business that they had started in the area was setting up a cinema now for some of us that were there you know I had students in my class from Nigeria and um, from Portugal from Italy it was really um, a mix um, you know a, a melting pot of different nationalities and for some of us we didn't really understand how could a cinema be a social business what is what is social you know what is um, altruistic or we didn't really understand um, but speaking to the people that had actually founded that social business, what they had said is that um, a real problem that they struggle with in that area and in the UK in general is around the um, loneliness of el elderly people, where you have old people who um, don't ha really have a sense of community. Um, you know, they uh, maybe they, their, their family members have moved away. Um, they don't have sp people to um, you know, speak to and connect with on a regular basis. And this has serious implications for their mental health. And so they got together and started a cinema and used the cinema as a basis to build social co uh, social networking in their community amongst elderly people. And so you can really take anything that you are passionate about and seeing how is the thing that I'm passionate about or a skill that I have that can add value in the community. So that was the one. Um, in terms of getting practical um, and you know focusing on what's important, um, I really want to encourage you, um, you know, who, who who asked this question, to seek out a mentor um, or um, you know multiple mentors and really thinking about um, the people that you can rely on to build you up. There is there are so many things in my life that I have said yes to, maybe even this lecture, um, or you know, things that I wanted to pursue that I didn't think I was good enough or I didn't think would lead to anything. And some of those things I'm sure I did well at, while other things I'm sure I was ordinary and um, you know, uh, not I didn't excel in that activity, but it was still good for me because I still learned from it. Um, but the reason why I was able to say, you know, you can say yes to some of those things is because you have a network of people around you that that are supportive um, of you. So um, I think, you know, obviously one ha does have to, um, you know, think about uh, the different ways in which they um, they want to, um, you know, pursue their dreams and aspirations. Um, for me, I made a decision that um, work takes too much of time in my life and so I can't have a situation where I have um, you know a job and 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 of um, work and then outside of work then pursue the things I'm passionate about um, I really sought to bring those two things together but not everyone is in that situation and so it's around you know have you could have a job and then you know pursue those things outside of that or thinking about phasing um, how do you go about um, you know, phasing um, different things for different stages of your life. So I'll leave it there. Back to you, Chair. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sumaya. I, I think as you were answering the last part of, of the question, um, there was a, I attended some, uh, some training and they said one of the key words or the motto, mottos that they use were say yes to life. So as we still trying to unpack and understand how we need to, you know, make certain decisions for our lives, um, we need to say yes for opportunities. And I am fully in agreement to that. Here's another question, um, a statement leading into a question. I have heard of recent research suggesting that men are greater risk takers than women. And that might be why they tend to pursue opportunities more. How can we really encourage women to do the same? And then a comment, what an inspiring story. Sometimes we can't change the system or the world, but we can make a meaningful change in the lives of individuals. Um, and then here's a question. Where can women go to speak up if they feel that they are being treated unfairly in the workplace, especially based on their gender? I found myself in conflict with myself and workplace. Decided to quit my job and study full time. I often found family and friends looking down on me. However, it became clear that I needed to take that leap of faith and also taking time, equipping myself and showing my two children that anything is possible. And especially when you are in conflict with self and workplace, one can change course and be the change you want to see. Thank you, Ms. Sumaya, for your inspiring um, words. Um, thank you so much uh, to the SPU community for these questions. Um, I think maybe I want to start on the one around risk taking. I mean, I'm, I'm really just speaking from personal experience, but I think the one thing, you know, when is it that you will take a risk? Um, so um, this is actually research in early childhood development where, um, you know, they do research around um, kids that come from supportive environments. So they find that if when with a child um, that is adequately loved and getting attention, that when you put something new in front of them, they're willing to take a risk. They, you know, they'll reach out, out for it. They'll try to buy it and try to, you know, they'll spend their times trying to um, figure things out. Whereas when children are environments where they don't necessarily get uh, in supportive and affirmate, affirm, affirming environments, when you put something around them, they'll get easily distracted and be more worried about the people around them than the actual activity itself. And um, I think it just resonates with, uh, in my personal experience, I think the two things um, uh, is around support and confidence. I think, um, and that's really what my intention with the, with the, you know, with the speech here today was, which, which is that I think men have um, um, more access to supportive environments compared to women. And they create these supportive networks for themselves where they are either consciously or unconsciously motivating themselves um, through seeing how other men are doing things. Um, and that's then also reinforced by society's messages that reaffirm their greatness and how wonderful and amazing they are. Um, and, and, then, and then you have the issue of confidence where um, you know, sometimes I feel like when I get, um, you know, asked to speak maybe here or do anything, my first concern is, oh, but will I be valuable and will I make a contribution and, um, you know, will it be worthwhile of people's time? Whereas a lot of men, it's like, oh, this is an amazing opportunity. I'm going to take it because you'll be great on my CV. Um, and obviously I'm making a broad generalization, but it's with the intention of showing that, you know, there's a there's a certain confidence um, that I think that um, that I think and again, I'm not trying to get into gender tropes here, but but I think that there's a lot more work that we need to do around supporting each other as women and also a big role to play here around men. Um, I mean, I'm I, I'm honestly incredibly fortunate to have a very supportive partner and um, husband and and a father and um, and and those kind of male affirmations does does wonders for a self for self esteem. Um, obviously, you know other people in your life, but I think um, men in this discussion asking themselves, what is it that I can do to play um, to be an ally? 
you can be an ally around supporting the woman in your life, about affirming them, you know, telling them how incredible they are. That book that I had cited, um, Grit by Angela Duckworth, she tells a story where she was asked to give a TED talk and she was incredibly nervous. And as soon as she came off the stage um, and that, you know, the, the TED talk has ranked up millions of views and is also featured on the TED page, um, TED talk page. She says that as soon as she came off the stage, she went straight to her mother and her husband and said, I need affirmation. You know, like I need I need support. Like I didn't want critique in that moment. I didn't want feedback. I just needed to feel supportive. And there's so much more that we can just do in terms of supporting each other and building up each other. And it really doesn't take away from from us in other ways. Um, so uh, my general. So what I do just as a personal technique for me, I don't know if it's helpful for other people, is that um, to avoid me saying no, I generally say yes, and then I think about it later. So my first reaction will be like to say yes, and then um, you know maybe two weeks or whatever time before, then I'll completely stress out, go through the different phases of anxiety and then low self-esteem, but I've already committed. Um, and honestly, it's, it's, it's been really good for me because otherwise I, there would have been so many things that I would have said no to only because I, I would have thought that I would have gotten in my own way um, and would have thought I'm not good enough or there's people more experienced or, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So find the technique or the people that you want to speak to um, and, um, you know, like really trying to form those supportive networks. And on that point, I do want to say that um, it could be that you don't necessarily have supportive networks or supportive friends. Um, and sometimes people don't necessarily um, are supported themselves, so they might not know how to support. So, you know, a way in which you can go about developing these cultures of support is about you being supportive yourself and almost indirectly teaching people how to affirm by you being affirm, you know, um, uh, being affirming to people and to motivating people and encouraging people. Um, so you can, you know, also go about uh, indirectly creating these really positive cultures um, around, um, you know, supportive confidence uh, network. So that was just on the risk taking. Um, and um, but but also on that point, there's undoubtedly structural issues that help and institutional issues that facilitate men being risk takers. Um, and I think I think that really circles back to or pursuing new opportunities. And I think that circles back to what the professor was saying in the introduction um, around Professor Braxton about, um, you know, how do we talk about equity and not necessarily equality? Because there's definitely mechanisms that need to be in place. Um, so, you know, institutions need to think about are they putting sufficient personal development resources in place for their uh, for their uh, staff and especially their, their, their female staff so that, you know, whether it's coaching that they need or need to needing to study extra or whatever skills development that institutions are directly supporting this. Um, I'm very grateful that I, I do come from an organization that's both predominantly women a predominantly black woman um, and that does have those kinds of mechanisms in place uh, to help facilitate uh, personal development. Um, so so I think, yeah, that was the one um, around speaking up to um, the I'm going to come to the third and then go back to the second question. Um, the, the person shared the story around, um, you know, quitting their job and going to study. Um, and I almost want to link this third question to the second question. Um, I was in a situation where um, I was feeling like I was getting, I was doing, um, you know, work uh, for this particular organization, and and I felt that uh, I was being mistreated. Um, there, there, there's, is, there's unfortunately something you're going to encounter in the workplace, especially being a strong young woman, which is the fragility. I call it the fragility of the male ego. Um, it's probably not a new term where you combine, it's this toxic mix of po uh, power um, with this fragility of the male ego. We're not able to, uh, you know, take feedback from women, feeling very threatened. Um, you, you almost have to um, operate on eggshells because you know that you misuse a word and it could spark, um, uh, you know, a reaction. 
Um, and, um, you know, I then disassociated myself from, from that particular formation um, and I went to go do other things. Um, and, and I'm really happy I left because then, you know, there were other formations that I was able to be a part of, um, you know, going forward. So, um, you know, toxic situation, not everyone. Um, I then created an alternative plan where I then went on to do other things for myself, but not everyone is in that situation. And it's not only a work situation. You could be in voluntary associations or in NGOs and things that you're doing your part time. Um, and it's incredibly important to, to, uh, to um, you know, speak up and speak out. Um, so, so, yeah, that's the, the, the one thing I wanted to say is, um, linking to the second question that um, you you must speak up even in situations where you think that it's common knowledge because sometimes only when you make a, f a fuss about things and I don't like these words because they sometimes you know negatively connotated to women about causing a scene and you know being loud and making a fuss but you know bringing something to the fore um, in a workplace and being vocal about it can be a way to uh, really put it at the forefront of people's minds um, and obviously, like depending on the organization, there may be HR processes, etc. Um, and also, you know, we, we do live in an age where, um, in a way, thankfully, you are able to speak out publicly around organizations and around cultures and um, uh, formations that do exhibit these kinds of behaviors, uh, which, which, if needs be, is something that you must do. Sorry for the very long winded answer, but back to you, Chair. Yeah, no, we got the gist. Thank you so much. And I think that links to the, the question that was posed um, by, by, by one of our participants here. Where can women go to speak up if they feel they are being treated unfairly in the workplace, especially based on their gender? So there's obviously the internal processes that need to take place. If not, then I'm sure one can, can step outside. Then Ms. Hendricks, uh, you are doing very well and good um, in your response to the questions. So there's a, a couple of more questions here. Men are sometimes also oppressed in the workplace based on class and race. What can we do as women to make sure that we uplift people who are marginalized and oppressed? OK, and then there's another question, Ms. Hendricks, thank you you so much for your inspirational talk. I gather your address today is about motivating young women, but my question relates to the institution. Do you perhaps have some practical ideas that you can share with a young university like ours to promote gender e equity within the university and the sector? Can we pause um, on those two um, so that you can respond? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. It's almost like they phased these questions, like they got harder um, <laughs> as you went along. Um, I do not at all want to, 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 you know, also give the impression that I'm a fountain of knowledge, but what, whatever, you know, ways in which I can add value to these questions, I will. Um, and again, just to say, Chair, um, um, you know, I'm, and you're also coming here with a wealth of experience, and if you have anything to add to the, um, you know, to the questions being asked, please, you know, feel I, I would be an honor to share this engagement session with you. Um, yeah, no, I think around, um, you know, the idea that, um, you know, men also uh, being oppressed and that's the one and then the intersection of, um, um, you know, class and, and race. Um, I think that there's a few things. So one is, um, and this is just a personal thing, um, and I'm not trying to be unkind in any way, but it is personally for me sometimes difficult, um, you know, to to speak and engage around the struggles of men um, when there's so many issues um, that women face um, around toxic masculine masculinity and about patriarchy. Um, so I'm not trying to say this to be unkind in any way. And I know there's serious issues around, you know, how we conceptualize masculinity and, and things that need to be dealt with. Um, but I wanted to say that from a personal perspective, um, I do find it difficult for me to exert mental effort on this, um, given the challenges that women face. So um, it's it's a for me it's a prioritization um, you know issue. But when it comes to being a um, a good human being or trying to be a good human being, I think 
um, you know, the things that we support, uh, spoke about around being supportive and building the confidence of other people and, you know, etc., cetera, um, is definitely something that one should do across the board. I mean, it shouldn't be limited to, you know, a particular um, agenda. And especially because, um, you know, the vice deputy vice chancellor talked about the complexity of the the complexity complexities and about how must complexify the space and the intersection of gender and race it does make it complicated because you can have a situation where so I'm a young colored woman but um, you know am I more oppressed or am I less oppressed than a black man or um, you know as a as a colored man is a colored man more or less uh, oppressed than a white woman. You know, sometimes we can get into oppression Olympics about this. So I think it's and, and, and sometimes, you know, it is difficult to 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 manage these different complexities. So just just as a personal, you know, approach is around trying to be a supportive, you know, if there's young if you want to be supportive towards young people, be supportive about to young people, um, you know, in general, um, regardless of where they come from, um, et cetera. Um, that should be your your personal approach, um, especially given these complexity complexities around the intersection of gender and class. Um, you know, you could have someone who, um, you know, comes from a well off um, family. They're a black male South African, but um, as a result of being a black male South African, there's certain obviously oppressions. Um, that they are subjected to. And so, you know, if you were going to have an approach where I'm going to be, um, you know, supportive and um, create these mechanisms of confidence building and support um, that exclude that demographic, then you're going to run into serious problems because it's what is your mo what is your motivation? Are you trying to be up motivational and uplifting to everyone or only a particular demographic? Because they them because different people um, you know, face different types of inequalities. And um, obviously that's all math you could do in your head or you can try to develop for yourself just general precepts that this is in general what I'm going to do. But given, um, you know, I think that there's a particular deficit in this area, I might, you know, exert a bit more effort in, in towards X group of people. Um, so I think that's that's the one. I think the one there was one more question that I can maybe just um, it was around, you know, in an institution, how do you build uh, mechanisms for gender um, equity? Um, wow, well, I think that that's that's really the big question, right? Like I think um, whether it's a family institution or a big institution like a university that we all have to grapple with. Um, I think the one um, around honest conversations that you had mentioned is important uh, because I think, you know, there's an assumption that people don't necessarily know what they need, but I think there are, I think people know what they need, um, you know, um, as we build towards a more equitable society. Um, and I think how do you, how do institutions have honest conversations around um, around gender, around race, around class, the intersection of these different um, um, elements. Um, so, so I think that with especially coming from, um, I work like, you know, dialogue work is part of my work. So, um, you know, coming from the dialogue and advocacy team at the foundation. Um, and I don't think we have enough honest conversations. I think we talk a lot, but I think when it comes to having honest conversations around things that make us feel uncomfortable, power structures that make you feel uncomfortable, how patriarchy can live out in an institution, even if there's no men, um, you know, present. Th th those are kind of difficult conversations that you need to have. Um, and in that, it's around. Um, I would I would just maybe say talking about both the institution and the individual. So thinking always about what is it around the institution that we can do to change, um, you know, institutions change, they're living organisms, but then also thinking about how do we support people within those institutions? Um, you know, so like a macro and a micro lens is really important. Um, yeah, because we may want women, for example, to occupy more senior positions in an institution, that could be an institutional decision, but if you're not actually putting in place um, things that help facilitate that, um, then um, you you you're going to compromise your your bigger vision. The question or the the comment statement in leading into a question 
It is so sad that sometimes women also play a part in silencing women who try to speak up. Um, Kwezi specifically comes to mind. The woman who was supposed to support her silent, support her, silence her. How can we make sure that we uplift voices and not suppress them? And then, is Women's Day still necessary? <laughs> Women are already advantaged in spaces in the workplace in South Africa. Does the term Women's Day not exclude certain individuals? Can we not make it more inclusive? And maybe then just the last one. How do we move beyond our own fears of success? We oftentimes anticipate rejection beforehand, so create the circumstances for that to be realized. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think I'm going to start with the last question. Um, I'm not sure the age of the person that asked this, but I found that as I got older, you 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 get more, um, you go through the cycle. So you go through the cycle of, you know, pursuing something, getting rejected, but then seeing how things worked out for itself because there's some other opportunity that actually came along that was a better fit and that was, um, you know, more in line with your interests. Um, and so I'll give an example, um, I'm applying for my master's. So um, it was an incredibly difficult time for me because, you know, I had I got accepted at LSE and USL, UCL and different places. But then I, you know, so the, some of the places I got accepted, I didn't get funding. Um, and where I chose to do my master's, the intersection of those two things came together both getting accepted and funding. Um, but and although it was like an incredibly, I was like an incredibly low <laughs> period of my life from a confidence perspective, because I'm like, am I worthy? Do I have any value? Um, but then what happens is I then had this workout for me where I, I got to study in Scotland and it was just what I needed at that space in my life. I needed to, you know, live alone. I needed um, there was incredibly supportive professors there. Scotland's also a very diverse population, um, you know, very open and comfortable with difference. So it ended up working out. And so you go through those cycles or at least observe other people in your life going through those cycles um, that that will hopefully get you a bit more comfortable but with rejection and rejection sucks. Look, you're going to have like a day or two or like of like ice cream eating or donut eating, whatever it is, as a coping mechanism. But you, you know, you pick yourself up and you you try to, um, you know, you move on. So um, mm -hmm. I, I found those circles very, very useful. Um, and then just two, two other questions um, around Women's Day. Yeah, you no, know, even in me accepting this invitation, I was hesitant because I said, I mean, I everyone has their different primary identities. Um, and for me being uh, personally, being a Muslim comes before being a woman, like in my mind, in terms of how I think about myself. And so I don't often think about myself in relation to my gender. It's not something, even though it might be perceived that way, but at least about how I think about myself. So I was like, oh, should I accept this? I don't know if I have anything to say and such a thing. Um, but um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a question, you know, and, and it's, it's, it comes back to what you say, how do we not only have a day, but it's something that, um, you know, ties into a bigger programmatic approach around um, making the serious changes that we need to be making. Um, and then the point around silencing women. Um, yeah, I think that's a real serious issue. I think, you know, as we all enter new and different spaces, um, sometimes we, we don't like change, um, regardless of your gender, your race, your nationality, and how do you get comfortable with that and realize that things must change and things must evolve um, in order um, to be both fit for its times, but also um, for, for if you're trying to reach your full, in, uh, you know, full potential as an individual, having institutions and formations that don't evolve limit the other people can limit other people reaching, you know, their full potential. So I'm going to leave yeah. it there. I, I believe that was the last question. Yeah, yeah, that that in fact, that was the last question. So 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 thank you very much. But I think also maybe for one one second that I want to add is we need to notice how the world and life is changing and and maybe just going back to the question of Women's Day and you know, the idea was what was the initial purpose 
of putting this particular day in place. But at the same time, there has been so many boundaries that has been pushed um, for, for women. So again, this is a, the, the topic. It's a, it's a conversation that needs to be held. And, and I think on this platform and probably most academics that's here, that is one, this is one topic that we, we can really engage on, even as, as academics and, and trying to find a, a, a scientific answer, as I, as I can say that. So thank you very much, um, ladies and gentlemen, for, for your questions and, and your comments and, and for feeling inspired through the, the lecture brought by uh, Masumaya Hendricks. Um, the topic will remain relevant as we continue to create our narratives about generation equality, realizing women's rights for an equal future. We have come to the end of our public lecture, and I will now call on Professor Karen Hare to do the closing remarks and vote of thanks. Um, originally from Ireland, Prof. Karen Hare has produced two co-authored works on sol salty plaiki. One of the new directions in plaiki studies involved a series of articles that foregrounds formidable women who inspired plaiki. Her research focuses on the rewriting and telling of African peoples, cultures, and history from a post-colonial, non-Western and Afrocentric perspective. As an educator, Prof. Hare's experience includes building academic and research writing capacity at South African tertiary institutions, as well as design and delivery of undergraduate courses in post-colonial literature, South African history and African cultures. She is the acting head of School for Humanities and also teaches English at Soap Like University. Prof. Hare, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair, for that lovely introduction. Thank you, Sumaya, for that beautiful, uh, inspirational uh, talk that you gave us. Um, it's always, um, it's, it's delightful to listen to such <coughs> a person who has so much grit um, and also uh, you know, has demonstrated that um, ability to push push past rejection, and um, are you are able to come to us and share so much wisdom. I'm always very inspired by such young people who have so much wisdom uh, to share. It's not only the old that have so much wisdom. So thank you for that. Um, I just thank you for speaking to young women especially today and thank you for sharing such inspirational stories about women and for women um, my um, as an educator i am i teach literature so i'm all about stories and storytelling and um you know from from, from very young uh children love to hear stories they believe the stories that they are told um, but i also believe that the stories such as uh, the stories that you told us are actually the very stories that allow us to dream big which is what you have asked us to do but i'm inspired by the forgotten herstories and um, that are all around us in south africa um, as you heard, uh, that's one of the areas of research that I'm interested in. Um, and I'm interested in them because of the potential and the power that they have to empower us as women, the potential that they have, um, you know, to allow us uh, to dream. So um, I would just like to say on behalf of Salt Lake University, on behalf of all the students who were here today, on behalf of the young women and the women of all ages, um, we are absolutely thrilled to um, have had your, um, to have heard your words of wisdom, and thank you so much for sharing your stories. 
we um, we take on board your advice. Um, I remember you uh, uh, recommending to students that they start up societies to develop their interests. And you also told us that we must have some of the honest conversations um, about, about issues that may make us all feel uncomfortable, about issues um, about which women tend to perhaps be uh, silencing themselves. So thank you so much. Um, it was a real, uh, a really delightful Women's Day lecture. And thank you to all the uh, colleagues on the platform and to the participants especially for showing up today to celebrate with us.